Yes. Okay, cool. All oh. right, we are live. You ready? Okay. Welcome to I, uh... Working Towards Black. Uh, today, show, uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful woman uh, by the name of Akusa. Uh, Working Towards Black is um, what I hope an effort to mend and um, grow some of the relationships that we have across the diaspora and across Africa to start conversations that we need to have with each other, to dispel myths, to um, get to know each other better and get us to a place to where we can work towards a black identity, an identity that does not um, take away from your religious background. It doesn't take away from your nation. It doesn't take away from any of the other spaces that you occupy, but it allows us to have a sense of collective identity. And there's no one I know doing this work better than Akusa. So I'm gonna read, how are you? How are you? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Tanisha. Can you hear me okay? I can. You're a little blurry. Okay. I hope you're not blurry to everybody else, but we'll we'll okay. see. I know how that Ghana, that Ghana internet goes sometimes. And I'm sitting here right next to the modem. I tried to be in the best <laughs> position I can. <laughs> All right, so Akusa McGee is the founder of Akusa and Associates, an Afro diasporic travel, reparation, and relocation consulting, uh, coaching, and consultancy based in Accra, Ghana. Uh, she um, is well been there for well over 17 years. She's provided boots on the ground, guidance and advice about how best to plan a successful exit from the Americas to Africa. This has included identifying investment opportunities, business collaborations with indigenous citizens, purchasing land, housing support, employment opportunities, citizenship goals, and cultural coaching. Did I miss anything? No, that you've been on point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I, what I'd like is to start out with you kind of telling your own story. I know that you started in Mississippi, uh, you ended up in Mass, and now you are in Ghana and you have like all of these fascinating things. And I know we're not going to be able to talk about them all tonight. Uh, but tell me a bit about how you have ended up in Accra. Um, okay, so first of all, I would like to thank you, Barnes Global Travel, for providing me an opportunity to be here. I have equally been following you for years, and I think it started by um, some of, we have some mutual friends, but the friends that we have that are mutual are like bona fide people. So I was just like, okay, well, if she's a friend of hers, Tambisa, she's a friend of mine. So first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, my story, I traveled to Ghana in 2003 as a Fulbright Scholar, and um, I originally went to do research in gender equity and the STEM fields that led to me wanting to open up schools. At that time, I was an educator in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was selected to participate. Um, I was granted a Fulbright Scholarship. So I went to Ghana, I uh, went for academic reasons to do research and that led me to opening up schools, which led me to um, opening up my heart, which led me to um, doing so many different types of activities. Um, I was able to hit the ground running and I haven't looked back since. Um, that's the short version. Can you hear me? I can now, you came back. We're gonna struggle through this Ghanaian oh. internet, but we're gonna make this happen. Okay. Let me try to close some things. Okay, can you hear me better now? I can, I can. Okay. So unfortunately that's one of the challenges, but you know what's nice about it? I know it's one of the challenges that um, one of our people from the diaspora is going to come and fix. So I'm just waiting for it to land. So anytime you see conflict or you hear about different types of issues, be it technology, all of these are opportunities. All Absolutely. of these are opportunities for our people to return to 
Mama Africa to help um, build the infrastructure and to help it develop. So thank you all for your patience and um, just bear with us because we're trying to make it happen. Absolutely. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. I mean, Akusa is amazing. We we always we always miss each other when we're in Accra together. Um, but she's always doing something very fascinating and putting people together. And so I'm really excited to kind of get deeper into how um, how she's gotten here and also just where we're at. You know, um, I know we're equally passionate about this subject. I know that we have equal experiences. I'd like to kind of, I want to get deep into how you got to this place. I want to talk about love because I think a lot of people um, end up on the continent because of love, you know, and um, I think that that's a perfectly valid reason to go. Um, I want to talk about so many different things, but I want to start with your passion for getting African-Americans and I mean, pretty much the African-Americans, but the diaspora in general, back to the continent. Where is this rooted and how do you see this politically? Okay, so I want to say my first love affair, I hope you can hear me well. I can. Okay, my first love affair with Africa probably started in the library with my mom as a toddler. My mom was working in the library um, for lack of daycare, she would put me in the corner and just give me tons of books to read. All I can tell you is that I have always drawn pictures of Africa. I have always had this um, this calling to to belong. Um, I'm sorry, to belong in Africa, and it's been there since I can remember. Because some people always ask me, like, when did it start? How did it start? And I keep trying to remember as far back. And I just realized it's always been there. Um, I can remember talking about Africa with my first grade teacher. I can remember talking about Africa as an undergraduate um, at University of Massachusetts, teasing my friends. I remember telling them, we had this running joke, you know, if you keep effing with me, if you keep messing with me, I'm going to be in Africa with one baby on this breast and another baby on this breast. That was the running <laughs> joke um, that I used to tell them, I'm just going to up and disappear. This is actually before it made sense to me or, I, or before I traveled or before I felt I could really go. Um, after the sojourn to Ghana, West Africa. And, and so let me back up. I have been to Morocco. Um, yes. I had, I was stationed in Germany and I had a TDY, which is a temporary duty assignment at um, Rota Air Base in Spain. And if you're in Spain, is you can cross the border and technically come on into Morocco. Mm -hmm. So I did that illegally. This is before, because I'm military, we don't really go through the process at that time of acquiring visas and passports. You know, we just go somewhere and we have this freedom. So I found myself in Morocco and then I was contacted by my first sergeant. And, and they explained to me, I can't just go across the border. I had to seek permission and do all of this paperwork. So I had to turn around and come back, but I never forgot that experience. So that's actually the first time I actually set or planted my feet on African soil. From mm -hmm. that point, um, I, I years, many, 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 many years later, a decade later, I found myself for academic reasons. But I did want to say that my first passion was me just falling in love with the land. It wasn't about any man. It was just about my genuine love for weather and my genuine love for um, the people. So, and, and when I say people in terms of the hospitality, I was coming from Atlanta. And then I was trying to see if we had, if Southern hospitality was stronger than the West African hospitality that I received in Ghana. And, and I think they're on par. I think they're equal. I think they're pretty, I think they're pretty much alike. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because you're a Southern too. I'm so. a Southern girl. That's what we have in common. I think yeah. that, you know, one of the things that I know is my sensibility around family, around community, um, around values always dealt 
it, it always meshed better with Africans. And I think that's just a part of the proximity to Africa that people forget about the South. You know, I grew up in Texas. I've never had this lack of identity. You know, Texas is so deep and so African in so many ways. It was such an easy transition for me. I, I will say one thing I've never disclosed to you is I used to live in Dallas. But I lived there for a very short time. My mother graduated from Dallas Mortuary of Science. So she was a, um, a university student there and we were living there. I think I must have been in fifth grade at that time. And I didn't, I went back to Mississippi. Uh, but one thing I wanted to share with you, I think the South retains the Africanisms in yes. terms of the strong value systems, um, we have a lot. So when I came to Ghana, it was almost like I was in Mississippi. Even when I went to the village, the way that it looked, we call it the country. It looks just like the country. It just looks the same. So everything, it looks exactly the same. So when I was there, it just felt like I was taking a pilgrimage up Highway 49, past the McGee Plantation, right back into Belzoni, even that Mississippi. Um, so it felt very organic. One thing I would love to add, being in Africa, and let me just speak for Ghana, because it was different when I went to Tanzania. In Ghana, the actual atmosphere, the wind, the air, is almost like a natural aphrodisiac. So you don't, for me, it wasn't so much about falling in love with any human being. It was just, as I described it, every cell in your body relaxes and says, mm -hmm. you're home. And I can't, that's the best way that I can express this. You're not the same tense, the same anxiety, the, you, you're not experiencing any of that. It is just for the first time, I think I felt like true peace, just like yes. a peace of mind. And that is what I fell in love with. Yes. I mean, that's one of the things that I always tell people. And, you know, me and Ghana, Ghana be frustrating the mess out of me, but I love it there. And I'm never, I always feel better. I always feel better. And I mean, even when the electricity goes out or people, you know, do whatever it is they do, whatever relationships, whatever kind of crazy goes on, it, I never feel never feel the kind of weight that I feel when I'm home here in the U.S. So yeah, Ghana has this ability to kind of lull you into just this really interesting state. So I feel you on that one. Um, yeah. Tell me how this, so, and, and I think it's important because I do think that there's like this overall um, overarching idea that African-American women are to run into Africa because they want men, right? And and I think that although that's a valid reason to, to, to grow your territory and explore, I think I know so many women that are going to increase their job opportunities, that are going to figure out how to help other people create opportunities on the continent. And and I think that sometimes they um, they try to play us, girl, they be trying to play us with <laughs> making it seem like it's just simply for that. But at the same time, I know that you have also, you have, you did fall in love and you have helped other people build relationships that are more in line with their value systems, that are more supportive for them. Let's talk about that too. Okay, so here, here's where I will start. Um, a few years ago, I'm a natural matchmaker and you know, I'm a Capricorn. We think we do everything perfectly. So, um, and I, I think I am the dopest matchmaker there is. I got about 17 couples under my belt and I check in with my couples. Everybody is doing great. Um, it's, it's funny because usually the narrative is when we come here, men are looking for a green card. So let me switch this a little bit. I think when I came, I was the person looking for the green passport, the green African passport. So when you look at it from that sense, it's not about, we're not scared to fall in love, to, to, to just put our heart on the table because I'll be honest, let me speak from my experience. I was after, at that particular time, um, the green card in Africa gives you access to travel to all of the other 53 countries 
without a visa. You can own land um, at times without a lease because if you get married, you also become a citizen, but you obtain um, all the rights of a citizen in addition, um, in addition with political inclusion. So some of us professional women are so savvy that, um, let me flip that, we're after, we're after different things. With that said, um, African men, I think, are different. And let me, let, me, let me qualify this. I think Ghanaian men are different. Um, <laughs> oh, you're going to get yourself in trouble on this one. Oh, I can't I can wait to see the comment. I, I can speak on it. So, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up in the Northeast. Um, I'm a Southern girl growing up in the Northeast. And when it came to, to love, um, we're a little bit, let me speak for me. I was a little bit naive, you know, it's, it's almost like um, country mouse meets city mouse if I can explain it. So you come from the South, you come to the North and there's all these games and, and all this new territory. And you basically have to learn how to play games to be in love. And you also have to learn how to build a wall as a defense mechanism to protect your heart. Because if you get with the wrong one, and I'm, and I'm about to drop this, I live in a Caribbean community in the Northeast. And Jamaican men ain't no joke. They run through women. My son's dad is from the Caribbean. And um, it was just like a heightened level of distrust complicated with so many, 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 many layers of issues. Um, by the time I reached Ghana, I was just happy to meet somebody that was just like honest, they didn't know anything about games. This doesn't apply to everyone, but I can just be my true, honest self. No inhibitions, no fear. Um, and, it, and, and I would say it's the first time I think I've, it's almost like having a teenage love as an adult, if I can explain it. It was like really pure. I'm not saying that that works in every case. Mm -hmm. But for me, that was my experience. But by the time I had, because I was from the streets, I'm from the Northeast, so we come with our game face, and then we meet the Kwame Kojo or Kwesi that's going to break all of that down and say, yo, um, one of my colleagues, he says it best. He said, listen, I'm not no half-baked man. I'm a full, I'm a full man. And... Mm. That part was a part that I had never experienced. A true, okay, I take it back. I have some cousins from the South and I have my daddy. Mm -hmm. When I got to, to Ghana, I felt protected. I felt nurtured. I felt like I didn't have to be, I didn't have to take the lead. I could just sit back and relax and somebody else could take the will and go. That is mm -hmm. what I fell in love with. And not only one, there was a whole community I, of these men uh, and everybody was on hold. Hold on one second, let me just. Yeah. I felt protected, I felt nurtured, mm -hmm. I felt. I'm not sure like how to. I didn't have to be, I didn't have to take the lead. Sorry, I'm trying to to figure out these systems. I'm listening. Okay. So I think that's what I felt in love with. I felt like for the first time I could just be a woman. And I grew up believing in the traditional roles that men should be head of the household, that, you know, women, my mother was a civil rights activist. My mother was a very liberal. My mother probably people would label her a feminist according to where we are today. Um, my mother was very liberated. So I, I think I'm a hybrid. I was this liberated woman with a lot of traditional values. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I found a place for me amongst the Ashanti women and, and the Ashanti community in Ghana where women could be um, strong, but you could be strong and feminine versus strong and masculine. Your strength wasn't viewed as masculine it was, it was accepted as a feminine trait, one. 
Um, the Ashanti region is a matriarchal society, so women make major decisions. Um, and I could be as loud as I wanted to be, and I could be as graceful as I wanted to be. And none of those were considered negative characteristics. I could just be myself, my true self. And I, it was, it was the first time. It was almost like a new birth. Like mm. there was no judgment. You were expected to be strong. You were expected to be strong and also be a woman and also be in a relationship with a man and know that the man got this. I still don't see my girlfriends having that advantage living in America. My my close, my best friends, they all got like, it, it, it's even foreign to me now. So I can honestly say I'm not even attracted to, <laughs> I'm being word up. I'm not even, even when I come home, I'm not even attracted. Listen, I'm used to when I go somewhere, like here my money is no good. I don't care if you're buying a juice. I don't care if you're buying dinner. I don't care. I just, you know, I was struggling to get up to make this on time because I needed a transformer. I ran outside with my money and the person was insulted. It was like, you know, Akusia, what do you think this is? Leave your American stuff in America. So with that, um, it's different here. And, and I'm okay with that difference. Mm -hmm. I want to, I mean, I think that this is something that's a valid conversation that people have oftentimes a hard time really conceptualizing. And I think a lot of this really is about value systems and what what has been maintained on the continent and some of the misconceptions. You know, I, I hear so many misconceptions around, you know, African men being controlling or African men being this or that. And there, you know, are structures in place where, you know, maybe there's multiple women and things like that. I think a lot of this stuff needs to be deconstructed and really talked about um, because I've never had that experience. On the continent, I've I've really had very positive experiences of support, um, really a lot of support for the type of woman that I am, um, the way that I move through the world. I've I've actually never experienced that like hyper masculinity or you know extreme sexism that I experienced in the U.S. Um, and I do think that there are structures in place, and those structures are set up for you to live, you know, cer a certain way and those can be beneficial. We also know that there's a flip side to it where African women are not always in the best positions, right? And so I think that there's so much we could do a whole show and I might just pull you in on a little panel conversation about this particular subject cuz I think it's like it's something, you know, when we talk about Sankofa, right? There's stuff that you go back and fetch, right? And then there's some stuff you need to just leave alone. But this is one of those things where I think it's important to really figure out how we go back and we catch some of the stuff that we're missing and that has been destroyed in our communities. Um, and at the same time, really evaluate, you know, where we are. So I, I think this is an interesting part of the conversation, but you're so dynamic. I don't want to make this all about love, right? Because you are on the continent doing the damn thing. I watch you and I'm like, look at this girl, where is she at? What's she doing now? I remember I saw you during um, New Year's, I think it was New Year's on the back of a moto. And I was in some, I was on, I had a group with me. And I was like, oh, God, ah! and you didn't hear me, but you know, but I see you moving and let's talk about some of the things and systems that you set up in place, not just for African-Americans, but just you're, you're working at a variety of levels on the continent. So let's talk about those opportunities for people that are interested. Okay. So one of the, so first of all, thank you. And what you said, I just want to affirm is so powerful. And I just want to say that we watch each other because you have been equally inspiring and you and I have never really had a chance to just sit and have that girlfriend talk. It's coming one day soon. But, <laughs> you know, I just want to say that I'm equally inspired. And um, you, you have this magazine, what is it called? Free Black Woman magazine. Free, free Black <laughs> Woman. And I was just like, yes. Um, I, but I am trying to not take on some new things. Um, that's one of the things I had to limit myself on. So opportunities. So coming to Ghana, one of the first things I did is I became the general manager of a popular radio station at that time, 5FM. Um, 
doing so gave me access to use all of my skills that I, um, I had made a living with in the United States, working for different record labels, working in college and radio promotions, which is actually how we have a mutual, we have many mutual friends. So I started following you because I was like, it seems like our paths are across because we're in the, um, it seems like we share the same circles. Mm -hmm. So those skills were easily, I was easily able to transfer upon coming because at the time I came to Ghana, it was just kind of right to get involved and do promotions, entertainment. I began to work with um, many of the artists, which I'm happy to see have evolved into some of the world greatest um, artists. We have Shatawali, um, and it's funny because all of these artists, he's a hot, uh, he's a hot <laughs> But all of these artists, um, to see them from their humble beginnings and to see, I just, someone posted, um, dug up a picture and they posted it. And they were like, you know Shatawali? And I was like, yeah, he's one of my artists. Um, but back then he started as Bandana. So watching the Shatawalis, the Stone Boys, the Saminis, the, um, all of the different artists that we start off with, DJ, DJ Vision, which is now, um, he's now moved to the United States and he's making a little noise. Um, I was able to easily transfer those skills. And that was a time when um, and you're in Connecticut, um, in the early 90s, I used to do outdoor concerts um, in Hartford called the New England Music Festival and Reggae Splash. So my team, um, I worked with um, two young men. We called ourselves GI Promotions, and we used to bring like Beanie Man, Bounty Killer, Barris Hammond, like all of the, at that time in the early 90s, the big reggae stars, um, we were bringing them to Hartford. That was a big deal, though, because at the time, we were the only Black people allowed to um, do these large outdoor festivals in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And if you live in the, the Knowledge Corridor or the Northeast Corridor, you, you, and you understand the demographics, the statistics, and the numbers, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, they don't just get black people permits to have these large outdoor concerts. So I was able to bring all of that to Ghana, um, easily transition into radio. I had done radio in Springfield for many years at um, WTCC 90.7, which is one of the, the staple radio stations um, in Springfield. Um, from there, I did, I got into radio station, to radio actually because I opened up a girls' school and I needed, I didn't have money for advertisement. So then I said, well, hell, if I don't got money for advertisement, if I become the radio station, I can advertise all I want. Mm -hmm. All of this sounds easy, but it wasn't easy. Right. There was such a, a, a cultural learning curve. Um, and so while I was able to bring some skills, it was, it was mostly new things that I was learning. Because radio in America was different from radio in, in Ghana. And even though I was blessed to be able to work with a with an English speaking radio station, everything was like different. Um, from there, I ended up doing the schools. I ended up having two schools. Um, the high school girl, that was a hot mess. I'm just gonna give you a story real quick. So I'm an educator, and one of the things that I see is all of the young educators. We, you know, this was before Oprah had the school in South Africa. So mm -hmm. we all come, we all see it. We do very well in education in America, and we say we're gonna go and we're gonna open up a school. Girl, hell, okay. Let me say this. I'm gonna give you one scenario. I opened up a high school in a in a rural town in the Ashanti region. They came to me, all the young ladies had moved out of the dormitory because they said another young girl had put a curse. <laughs> and so then I learned that the only way to break a curse was to get a queen mother to come and to break the curse. When the first time I was like, if y'all don't take yourself back to that dorm and go to school. <laughs> This was a major thing. If we had a PTA meeting, you would have thought it was Corona back in, in, in that community at that time. 
So I handle it the way that I would handle it in America. Like, ain't no curse in there. Ain't no ghost. We're going to go back to school. Y'all just um, trying to get out of your exams. Mm. I, I could imagine to, how that went. I had to go get the queen mother. There were some rituals that they had to do, but they had to break the curse before students went back. I'll give you one more example. Um, I, I opened up a school and I'm telling this story because I know there's a lot of educators that always come and I'm always quiet when they say, I want to open up a school. I had an elder sister warn me and I didn't listen to her. I'm the ambitious Akusia, and I was like, well, I ain't going out like that. I'm going to open up my school. Everything this lady told me that was going to happen, happened. Mm -hmm. So out of this whole lesson, I learned to respect some of the pioneers that have been here because I had to bump my head a few times and be rescued um, mm -hmm. in order to, to, to slow down. But the other lesson was the I started a, a, a volunteer service learning project where I have volunteers. And my volunteers would come from America. I did this for like about eight years. They would stay for like one. First, I started off as... Um, as summer vacations and summer breaks and, you know, entertaining the volunteers. Then I said, okay, well, in order for them to be fully culturally immersed, they need to stay here longer. So we went to six months. We eventually said, okay, no, you have to be here at least a year. I never had a shortage of volunteers. So the volunteers would come. The problem is my students was older than the teachers. Then the dating thing happened. So then I said, uh, -uh. I can't have no, then when the teachers came, the 25, the 26, the 27, the 30 year old men decided they want to come back to school. So I said, mm -mm, y'all can't register in this school. Y'all have to go to another school. Y'all going to have to go to the GED program or the, um, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the non-traditional schools. So they told me, no, they have the right to register in my school. I got on the I got I got on the bus, came back down to our crowd, went to Ghana Education Service. They said, uh, Akusia, we don't have this this thing here. No, what what do you mean? Uh no, the people can register to go to school. I said, but he's 30 and my teacher is only 25. They said, Yeah, we don't have age thing here. So it's true. You have to accept these students. So then it basically was my students started, no, my teacher started falling in love with the students. You know, you no. look backwards. <laughs> so here I am trying to tell these grown women that they can't date a 30-year-old man. It just became so awkward. So then I ended up closing down high school for, for, other, for other reasons, but those are just two cultural um two cultural situations that was just like a really steep learning curve for me. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the first one, I tried to open up a girl's school. I said, I'm coming up. You know, all my research talked about gender equity and STEM. My, my NGO is called Girls Institute of Science and Technology. No problem. Open up the girl's school. The first person that came to register was um, the hospital accountant with his son. I said, no, 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 no. This is a girl's school. They said, why would you bring a school to the village and only limit it to girls? What is this? So <laughs> everybody brought their boys and registered and there, and I ended up changing the name of the school to the Youth Institute of Science and Technology, but I kept the NGO as the Girls Institute of Science and Technology. So that was my first lesson. And one of the things that I learned is that not all the research that we come across, um, that I came across as a graduate student was accurate in Africa. So that was my first time that I realized oh, that yeah. all this research is really is politically skewed and it is racially motivated and designed to make Africa look depressed, oppressed, and um, excuse me, say unimpressive. That's mm -hmm. not a word, but I'm making it a word. Um, <laughs> And so I realized that once you're on the ground, you realize that the research is skewed. Mm -hmm. So, but also, I mean, thing, there's something where girls are not the 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 push for girls to be educated in Ghana is not the same push for boys to be educated. I mean, this is something that's real in Ghana. Okay, I would, I would be I wrong, say, and I will stand corrected. Don't come for me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I will say that that research is very outdated because that was the research I was 
operating the center I was operating from when I opened my school. And I had someone prove to me that there was more females in schools than males. Mm. So even right now, I'm at an engineering school and I have a large number of female students that are like mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer science engineers, computer science majors, which was to my surprise. So right now I'm trying to give away a scholarship and it becomes, I want to give it to a female, but I can't really back that up based on the current data mm. that I'm looking at. So, and I think that this is one of the things that I want the show to kind of deal with is, is breaking down some of the misconceptions. You know, we do have these ideas and um, I, I'm trying to figure out where I, even where I pulled that from. And I think it's from working with a girls organization, but it's run by an American woman, um, black American woman, but an American woman nonetheless. And so you don't always know how to place this. And I do think that there is this learning curve with culture and if you don't understand culture and you're not willing to take the time to really understand culture, it will be very difficult to transition to the continent. And I find that that is, you know, we kind of have a lot of the same issues when we bring African-Americans to Ghana and this idea of um, these conflict, girl, I know, I know, I'm about to get myself in trouble with a whole bunch of people, but like, whoo, honey. The, the oh, I can talk about it. I mean, we, little, I'm gonna I, let you talk about it so I can save myself some um inboxes and drama. But you know, the the elitism, the entitlement, the um the sense that um there, there's so many different layers, and we both work and travel bringing people over. What are some of the things that you've experienced? Um, so first of all, one thing that I didn't say, and I wanted to know is that coming to Ghana, coming to Africa as a Black American is, is difficult because we come face to face with a privilege that we never knew we had. Mm -hmm. Because we come from America where we know privilege is something different. But when we start traveling, we realize that we too come with a set of values and, privi and privileges that we have to come to terms with. We know that it's different from white people privilege, but it's still privilege. And then you have to ask yourself, well, is there such a thing as white people privilege or black people privilege or is privilege just privilege, period, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the jury is still out on that. Um, three top things that I deal with when I travel. So first of all, let me just give a shout out to everybody that has traveled with me because I think I've been really, really blessed. So I travel in two ways. I have my own company, Akusi and Associates, which we do annual trips to Ghana and um, Tanzania. I started off working with large groups and I quickly realized I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy babysitting people. Let me just, and I have to be honest and real. So I, Someone pulled me like an elder person who had also been in a travel business and basically told me she had downsized. And, you know, being a young person like me, I was looking at the, the difference in the money. I was like, mm -hmm. uh, But one thing I realized is that I enjoy bringing small, intimate groups. Um, I can manage that. And I don't want to look at my like as, as a trip. I, I look at every trip as a learning experience with a group of people. I, I look at the world like either God is bringing me gifts or there's a gift that I'm supposed to give. Sometimes it's both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the top three issues. One is you, there's like three main characteristics. You deal with the person that has researched everything and they think they know everything from reading and a brat's guide or that, you know, now we have the internet or they meet mm -hmm. that one Ghanaian that they work with for years, that one Ghanaian who ain't been home in 30 years, who is giving them, who's trying to help them and who's equally excited because they're going to their country. But that person ain't been home in 30 years. They don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you meet that person that comes and they just know everything. Um, and, ha and, and I had this happen recently. No, it happens every year when I take people to Tanzania and they go online 
and they tell me that they need a yellow fever shot. But I said, but we're going to Zanzibar and you need a yellow fever shot. But if you go to the Tanzania U.S. State Department travel site, it says you don't need it. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, because these are grown people, if you don't get it, then no problem. But if you get stuck at the border, I'm not coming from you and you're not getting a refund. Um, I've had people really in tears apologizing because they get the shot because I'm very adamant about it because I know what I know. And then when we get to the border, they realize that in Tanzania, when you get off that ferry or you come through that airport, if you don't have that yellow that, card, they have somebody that standing card. there asking for it. Yes. And if you don't have it, you ain't getting in. And I watch them turn away white folks all the time. They start crying. They start thinking about talking about their hotel that they paid for, the money that they spent. And people do not care. And I don't blame them because they have to protect the people in that community. That's their first um, responsibility is this Corona is a perfect, is a perfect um, example. Um, and they, they, they close their borders immediately. Uh, one thing I'll pick up Tanzania, and especially Zanzibar, is that Zanzibar was able to produce a local remedy just like Madagascar did. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't as publicized, but they knew how to treat themselves of this illness. And that's why the president can confidently get on get on TV and say, we ain't got no more corona. Y'all can come to Tanzania. You can come, want. girl. That's my, yeah. that, Tanzania is my, my next, if I can't get back into Morocco, I'm going to sit it out in Tanzania before these elections start. And then I oh, might sneak my way to Ghana, but you know, don't tell no, nobody. Go to Tanzania, it's beautiful. And don't fall in love there like I did. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing I will say, I want to talk about something positive. This is the thing that I see now. Um, I, is this number two? No, no, I'm skipping that because I realized I don't want the interview to just be all the negative stuff that happens on the trip because there's some positive. So let me skip to a positive and maybe come back to a negative. One thing that's happening, I don't really advertise. I'll post a flyer every now and then on my Facebook. But right now, I really do word of mouth. It's better for me to do word of mouth because if you've traveled with me, you have a up close and personal um, account of who I really am and you can speak to it. And I would want you to share that with whoever you are referring my travel service with. That makes it easier for me because then I know someone has broken it down, um, the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you've made a decision to travel with me. Mm -hmm. One thing that I always have is a cultural component, is a service learning component. We're not just gonna show up in Africa with our privilege. We are gonna leave having made um, a situation, a place, an event, an activity better. I remember in 2010 when we traveled to Tanzania and we were able to help the International Film Festival get off the ground. They were having all sorts of problems. We was rolling up with our laptops. Um, I was able to bring my teachers on board and just volunteer and we just rolled up our sleeves to make that work. It is now 10, 11 years going, the ZIF, they call it Zanzibar International Film Festival, it's still oh, going. But I remember when it was like two people up in the office, I think one was Oya Kali, and she was a sister from the US that was volunteering, rolling up her sleeves. And we were able to help make impact. Um, when we go to Zanzibar, there's, um, there's a Muslim Girls High School that we always volunteer, and I usually bring um, first aid kits for the school nurses because I want something that we usually bring like pads and first aid kits and I pass by Madame Sick, Madame Zena is a principal and I'll call her and ask, I'll call and ask what do you all need. We've given them like lap, lap um, I'm sorry, projectors for the teachers to use um, for their teacher. We've given them two LC, LCD projectors. So I'm just saying anytime you travel, let people know that we different. Like we, we, we come in to enjoy your son, but I always feel that the people in that community should benefit from us going there just as we benefit from the tourism experience. Let, and, let's, let's talk about that because I think that's one of the real major differences when we think about African-Americans specifically, but diaspora 
tourism on the continent, it can really be different if, if you have a decolonized mind and you're going. If you have a decolonized mind and you're going to explore Africa, because everybody don't got a decolonized mind going to explore Africa, um, you can have a very different experience. Have Tell me some of the things that you hear on the Ghanaian side, because I know you're steeped in Ghanaian culture, around Ghanaian people. What are some of the experiences, both positive and negative, that you're you're seeing from that? Because I think that this is where we start. The, the tug of war isn't necessarily between us. It's really how we're merging and working with the community. Um, okay, so the positive and the negatives. The negatives is always dress code. It's all it always because in America, and I find myself conflicted at times. Um, this has always been a struggle for me because at home we're really kind of liberated. We can wear what we want. There's, you know, we've grown so far beyond um, being measured by what we wear. However, when you come to um, when I first came to Ghana, it was just unacceptable to be in shorts. The only time you were going to be in shorts was when you was at the beach. And there was a certain connotation for a woman who wears shorts. You see a lot of it in Accra right now. Um, and that's okay. It's a metropolitan area, um, which is beaches all around. But when you go deep into the different communities and the villages, it's still kind of unacceptable. So as someone that brings foreigners here, the, the, the local people expect white people to behave a certain way. What mm. they don't expect is for us who have the same, um, they see us as the same people, is to behave the same way as Europeans. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's confusing. I remember when I was on my kick to work with HBCUs to bring black volunteers because it was always easy for me to get white volunteers and people to spend a gap year and to come to Ghana and to volunteer. And I understood it because um, they could afford to m most of the time. However, in doing so, the community would never see us in that role and would always um, assume that we didn't care, that we, 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 we don't have the same work ethic. Um, speaking of which, this is like a negative. I, there was a time I had two black female volunteers that I really work hard to get. One was from, I think, Tuskegee University, and another one was from like Tennessee. They were the worst volunteers I ever had. And the sad part is the community came to tell me that. Um, I had one young lady, we had a no smoking policy. Um, she was smoking in school. She didn't realize that this was an absolute no-no in this particular community. And she would lie about it. Um, in the evenings, the elders would come, knock on my door at my house, sit down, have a five-hour conversation about um, I should be very careful of who I bring in the community. And their work ethic was really different. And then it became difficult for me to explain. Like when I, when I did this volunteer program, I really didn't realize that when I had the idea that we process Africa different than white folks. We process it spiritually. We, we, we come with so much luggage. And mm -hmm. so um, when we do these volunteer programs, I, we need to design it for Black people, not just have this um, volunteer program for Becky and Sue. Becky and Sue is going to bring their privileges. They're going to come. They're going to um, attempt to be missionaries. And you're going to have to shut some of that down. I had an Asian young lady come in and she wanted to paint the fingernails of all the young girls. She, um, I wasn't around, she painted the fingernails. Nice pedicure spa thing to do in this community is a big no-no. Um, it is a very adult thing to do. And it's like I, I was accused of turning their female children into prostitutes. Mm. And so when the, when the volunteers and the visitors come, um, I am the one bringing these people to that community. 
in, in African culture, it don't matter what they do. I'm the one who brought them to that community. I am the one who took the blame. There was a, a Canadian European I brought and he had an alcohol problem and he was at a meeting and he said, his girlfriend um, says that licorice tastes like the condoms, like at a meeting. And I was like, did this boy just say that? Um, he would get publicly drunk and walk in the community and say and treat people. So that's the one thing I will say. I have heard and seen it all. Um, we probably need to have some sort of, you know, nobody wants to make their tour company academic, right? But the reality of it is we need to have some processing before we just continue to bring, you know, there's all these travel sites. It's exploded in the last 20 years. I mean, I've been doing this since like 2003. And mm -hmm. people I bring, we went from coming for a, a few weeks, coming for uh, research, coming for um, Christmas vacation, coming for gap year, and then coming to live for a year. And I allowed one, one young guy to stay for two years I've met in my life um, because I, I have to push them away. Um, so those are just a few of the negative things that have happened. It's really the disrespect for the culture and the, the lack of willingness to research about the culture when you come. Um, and the culture is so complicated and layered because you're just talking about the Ashanti. You're not talking about the Tweed and the this and the that and all of the different layers of how they operate separately and differently from each other. I want to ask you something really specific because we're getting down to the end. Okay. When you, because you know you're a visionary, and I know that mm -hmm. there's there are there's a small group of us doing this work, and we all know each other around this this world, right? When you think about what blackness, a black identity, could be for us, right? What does that is that something that you even think about, and what could that look like? What is your hope for us as Africans all over the world? That's a deep question. Um, and I don't think there's any answer to it. Um, 20 years ago, I would have tried to answer that in one sentence or one paragraph. Here is what I will say. Um, I came here calling myself African. Um, 10 years later, I knew I was an African American. Five years on top of that, I was unapologetically African-American. Five years after that, I'm back to being an African. Five years after that, I'm probably an African with, I'm the remixed African. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm the puffy in your remix African. That's the best way I can, I can explain this. Because the reality of it is there's a duality and, and, and it means a lot now to me. I even think it's a it's a it's almost like a quadruple trip, definitely triple, but quadruple consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because W. E. B. Du Bois talks about the double consciousness. But that double consciousness was just like us being in America, um, as an American and as um a um a black person. When you come to Africa, you're an American, you're a black person, African-American, and you're also an African. So it's almost like a quadruple, it's almost like a, a, a triple consciousness, but there's another consciousness that comes up. You become a refined African-American African. And then, um, it was always difficult for me because I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. I live in a Caribbean uh, community. So if you're not careful, most of my Caribbean people think that I am a Caribbean trying to pretend that I'm a Yankee. So I went through that when I was um, in high school that, oh, I think I'm better than everybody else. I've come from Jamaica and now I'm in, I'm in Springfield. 
I don't know how to act. And they always be like, well, which part you come from? I said, oh, I'm going to come from St. Mary. You know, I gate there. Yeah, if you go I gate and in Clonmel, that's where, my, that's where my yard, you know? So because I grew up in, in that community, then you're a Southerner. So there are so many layers of consciousness. But let me just tell you this. All of them are, I call them the, the beautiful struggle. I, I got mm. that word from Tanzania. It is the beautiful struggle. It is the, sim the simple complexity. And we just have to learn how to manage it. If I had to choose one, it would be that I'm unapologetically African-American. Because one of the things I love that I can't find anywhere around the world is our level of resilience. Yes. Um, I think our DNA you know, they talked about the, the mutations of DNA based on the ma'afa or the, uh, the, the middle passage. And I think there's some truth to that because when you land in Africa, you know you're different. Um, it don't matter how long you stay in the community. I, when I came here, I was in a rural community and I never came out. It's just recently that I started mixing with other people. Mm -hmm. um, so if I choose to be Ghanaian, I can't be. And I'm unapologetically Ghanaian. And I, I challenge everybody on it. And, and it makes them feel uncomfortable because I let them know that we're not asking permission to come home. We're coming home. Yes. And it's going to be, um, it's that uncomfortable family member that comes over for Thanksgiving that's just straight 100 and no chaser. And you scared, you want her to just stay in the corner or him to stay in the corner because you're scared he's going to tell a family secret. <laughs> So that's how yes. it feel. But I will say that um, one of the things I have evolved to is when my um, customers come or when they travel with me, they're buying land, they're building homes. It's becoming deeper than just touring. And that's what I always wanted. The touring yes. is just the front door is, is just, you know, you're from down south. So that's just the, the front porch mm -hmm. touring. And so once you come, one of the things I like to do that is very controversial is I want people to buy land before they come. Because on my tour, I want, I want to also take you to the land that you own. And mm -hmm. so that has been an uphill battle because everything out there says, don't buy land until you see it. Um, girl, don't trust nobody. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm like, nah, if you have somebody you can trust, by the time you come to Ghana three yeah. times, that's $1,500. You're going to spend $5,000 per trip, hands down. You're going to spend $1,500 to, tra to travel. You're going to spend another $1,000 for accommodations. You're going to spend another $1,000 for transportation, eating, and another thousand for all your outfits, your hair braiding, your going to the beach, whatever it is, your drum that you want to get made, the waist beads you want to get made, you're going to spend and drop 4,000. 4,000 is a plot of land, something that we have, well, we in the South own it, but let me say in the Northeast, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to find land owning Black people. Are they there? Yes, they're, they are there in very small numbers. In the South, we grew up knowing that you're supposed to have some land because we yes. talk in terms of land. You don't say my house. You say, oh, that's so-and-so land over there. Mm -hmm. We talk in terms of land. So when it, I came, it was just, they said I could own some land. I was up and running. So it's one of the things I tried to share with all of the people that travel with me. Um, I've gotten, we invest in vanilla farms in Tanzania. We invest in spice farms in Zanzibar. Everywhere I go, I try to collectively drop a little money and plant a seed so that in five to 10 years, and it's working, it's just now catching on like 15 years later, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. it's, it's working. I have a group coming in December, and when they come, they will be late. Are you think four, this December is going to happen, girl? You think it's going to happen? I got a group in December, but I'm not so sure. No, so December is gonna happen in Ghana. Just bear with us. The borders are closed because we're going through voter registration. Y'all got, got to know politically what's going on. Ain't nobody finna open up them borders until we finish voter registration. And then when voter registration is finished, everybody and they're gonna be on all on TV talking about beyond the return again. They're gonna play that little sad ass music, um, that little sad music, the little slave music. And I'm angry because they still calling this stuff castle. 
Every, it, we should never be referring to these places as castles. They're slave dungeons. They're slave dungeons. And yes. what I want to say before I go is that I admire you and I'm trying to be like you. One of the <laughs> things I've been I've been watching you do is this the what do you call it? The space family house. I don't mm -hmm. have the title to it. I love that. And I'm sitting here um trying well, we to got work projects away. to work on anyway. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm trying to work on how to support you because I have families now coming. That's the beautiful with this black exodus that's happened. I'm so glad y'all gonna be mad at me. I'm so glad Donald Trump in there because he bringing all these crackers out. Excuse yes. me. So um <laughs> Because y'all y'all had drank the Kool-Aid. Y'all drank the Kool-Aid with some Obama Hennessy. And then y'all sitting back thinking that everything is all good. I'm so Ooh, there's this deconstruction portion of this one. And we got a lot to deconstruct in these things. Lots of things to talk about. <laughs> but um, Africa, this is the new Africa. We're not talking about no mud huts. We're talking about... Um, Bugattis, Range Rovers, um, the freedom that I have here. I think you said you see me on a bike. That is my one thing that I love to do. I have this one friend that he's like, a, let me say a high ranking police officer and he drives bikes for, let's say the president, let's say. And when I get on the level of care that is provided, when I get on the back of that bike, it's amazing. That is my one thing I love to do is go for a nice bike ride in Africa. And I just want to tell your listeners that um, there's T. Barnes Global Lifestyle. There's um, Sister Yao with Sankofa Repatriation Assistance Program. We all have our clientele. And I want everyone to know that Black women, we can work together. You Absolutely. can be doing the same thing and you can support each other 100%. Mm -hmm. I have some we have to work together. People that they don't necessarily work for me. I'm a little bit too grit and grimy. I'm not all that polished. Um, <laughs> however, I know my girl, you I know exactly who you need to travel with. And I know that they're gonna have the experience that they desire to have and so much more. So Hello, thank I, I like I like <laughs> I like that. We don't necessarily, we ain't going to all the farms just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I think we need to merge these experiences, you know, I'm and I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about what we can do together. But I mean, I think that that's what this is, you know, like there, I love all the layers that you talked about. I mean, if I knew when we came on, there were going to be so many complexities to who you were because there's so many layers and it's exciting to see them unfold and for this identity to happen. And your point about being um, unapologetically African-American, you know, we have created, we are a tribe, you know, Africa is great for tribes and there's nothing wrong with tribes. There's nothing wrong with the cultures created from them. It's a beautiful thing to watch and experience another person's tribe, right? And I love the tribe that we have, you, me, you know, Diallo. I just see us all moving around Africa and helping people come. And it's, and it just, it warms me. I know, I know that if I get my ass in trouble at a border and I need somebody to come get me and be like, look, girl, I am stuck in Benin because I've been there. I need you to come help me out. I know I'm that sure there's, you know, where you at? Okay, stay right there. <laughs> I know that there's, name, we're, we're in this world, right? Lieutenant Commander, and he will be right there because that <laughs> has happened to me several times. And I think you mentioned that example. That's when I realized actually my power. I've had people stuck in Dubai, and yes. I've made a phone call, and I'd be like, my friend, I was at J. I was at JFK Airport and somebody just happened to call me. I was getting on the plane that they're stuck in Dubai. I was able, I said, what airline are you flying on? I ran over to that counter, called my people. They talked to their people at the airport. And mm -hmm. this person was allowed to board a plane just on a conversation. Yeah. And that's when I was like, I had another person that was like, yo, I'm at the airport. They won't let me on. I said, hold on. Let me, see. you know, and most of the time my people be wrong because we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. I used to get into like, yeah, dumbasses, you don't know. But I don't, I, we don't know what we don't know. Right. And I've matured to understand that you, 
myself, uh, sister, like everyone in Diallo, we are the bridges. We have to, yes. we actually lay our bodies down for people to walk over it and go into Africa Sometimes stomp on. Oh. Just being petty. <laughs> but that's the work that we're called to do when you it really is. think about it. Because we're not going to, okay, let me switch my I've worked plenty nine to five and there's a certain level of freedom that I have to have. But this kind of work, you you wake up creating it, you go to sleep creating it, you think about it 24 seven and then you finally accept the fact that it's, it's beyond passion. This is what Live you it. spiritually ordained yeah. to do in your lifetime. And Absolutely. so when you mature, you embrace it and um, I think that's just where we are now. And I'm so excited about where this is going for us. Yes. I'm excited about you in Morocco because I'm trying to, you know, we need to create a map. You need to see um, um, Tunisia in, in Morocco. You can see Sasha in Zanzibar. You can exactly. see Tunisia. You can see me in Ghana. You can see Ya in Ghana. It, it's it's with the beauty of coming to Africa, the real beauty is you can be your complex layered self. Yes. And you can do all of those layers yes. unapologetically and you can be loved for all of your layers. You don't have no to- pretending. No pretending, no yes. pretending. Cause I don't I, know, I mean, yeah, sometimes, yeah. you know, I be getting myself in trouble in Africa, but they still love me and they still accept me. So this is a question I ask everybody, it's how I'm ending every show. What is blackness to you? What does that mean to Akusa? Okay. I think when I think of blackness, I think of resilience. I think of strength. I think of um, I think of the sun. I think of melanin. And I think that we paved the way for the world. That's what I think about blackness. And I look at blackness as a journey. Um, we black for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. We're here in this time for a reason. I want to encourage everyone to embrace it, to step into your blackness. And I'll be honest, we got to come home. That's, I, that scares people. I um, know. The, the one thing that's beautiful about blackness when it comes to you and I, when people see us, they're not seeing someone on a television show. They're not seeing someone that they don't know. The, we are real people that they see us go back and forth to Africa and they don't see us come back sick. They don't see us coming back talking about lions and monkeys and mud huts and see us, you know, look at all the press. They see us coming back talking about love and romance. Glowing, girl. We be glowing. And, and business <laughs> and business. And let me tell you something about an African partner. You can have a business idea and that person totally 100% supports you and allows you to just do your business while they hold down the other things. Where else y'all gonna get that at? And I know there's a few minority, but for the most part, uh, blackness to me is love. Yeah. Um, it's, it's loving yourself. It, it's stepping into your full layered complex Maafa-ridden self. That's what Black means to me. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this conversation. I can't Thank wait you. for everything that's to come. Thank you guys for okay, tuning bye, in. Alicia, I love you. I love you too. Yeah. Thank you all for tuning in to Working Towards Black uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at six o'clock. Um, it is very late in um, many places, so their times may change. Uh, two o'clock, sometimes earlier, depending on where people are on the continent. Um, make sure that you are listening. Make sure that you, Akusa, I want to make sure I put up your, may, in the comments, all of your contact information. If you're interested in travel, you know, I, I'm about, I'm a party girl in Accra. <laughs> that's that's what I do. And I realize I've had to be really clear about that. If you're looking for a deeper cultural immersion, she is perfect for that. Um, if you are interested in traveling with her, she will have all of her info in the in the comments. 
Um, you please subscribe to uh, Global the Global Movement on Facebook. Um, I will put that link as well in the comments. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to Free Black Woman. There's so many things going on in T Barnes Landia. Um, you guys just keep up. Thank you, girl. I love you. Okay, power to the All people. Right. I love you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys.